money from federal highways, it'll come to you as either apportionments or allocations. The apportionments will be by far the largest amount. Probably uh, 90 to 92 percent of the money that the state receives is as apportionments and the remaining not eight or nine percent will be allocations. We distribute uh, apportionments by formulas. We run the formula for every state and of course nowadays we only have one but back prior to MAP 21 we had 13 formulas we ran for every state. But we run the formula then we distribute the funds on October 1st and if it's unless it's a weekend you're going to get them on the first uh, irregardless and once you receive apportionments uh, they're yours only Congress can take them back uh, Federal Highways has no authority whatsoever to take them back and uh, Congress does do it occasionally. You'll see things in uh, the appropriations that'll say uh, Congress is uh, taking back three billion dollars in unobligated line of credit. Well that would be the portion of your apportionments that you cannot use that particular year or you haven't used a, an amount of them for a number of years and uh, so they withdraw those and it's sort of a it's a gimmick because it, wh what are they withdrawing are they actually making you send them a check back or whatever now basically they're taking a number that's on a piece of paper they'll talk about reducing federal spending well it doesn't because it's a number on paper so it doesn't reduce federal spending but the way the accounting is done it looks great but it doesn't anyway with apportionments every state receives apportionments uh, back prior to map 21 when we had the interstate program for example Hawaii and Alaska, Alaska received interstate funds. Well, if you've ever been to either one of them, their interstate sure aren't like our interstates here, you know, so. But they were still eligible. And of course, what these pie charts show is about 92% of the amount authorized for the federal aid program is apportionments. The remainder would be allocated monies. What's the, What's the difference between allocated and apportionments? Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you about allocated now. Allocated monies, of course, being a lot less, but there are no formulas, okay, for the allocated programs. Uh, a lot of these are where states have to apply for the money. So everybody's not going to receive allocated monies. Uh, back when earmarking was real prevalent, like back uh, prior to MAP 21 through Safety Lou, they were doing a lot of earmarking. They earmarked the allocated programs because those weren't necessarily going to go to any particular state, so they, Congress would direct and say what they belong to. Uh, Allocations can go out any time during the year. Uh, it's not unusual to have them be distributed in September. And then you need to have something ready to go because you have to take have those funds obligated by the end of September before the new fiscal year. And with allocated discretionary monies, Federal highways can take them back and give them to another state. Reason being this, if it's a competitive type program and you have a project that you intend to use this grant on and something happens that you can't do the project, uh, we can take it back, give it to another state so it'll be used that year. Then the following year, uh, 
your state can apply again. And this does happen frequently, uh, rather than, if it's an earmark, forget it, we can't do anything with it. But like ferry boat money, for example, uh, we take that back routinely. If a state has a project and something happens, they can't do it, we can withdraw the grant, give it to another state, and then the following year they can do it. And of course, being that uh, allocated monies are a very small part, very limited amount, not every state receives some. Uh, every state doesn't necessarily want some, uh, like ferry boats. You know, there's only certain states that have ferry uh, boats, so it's not something that's going to go to other states. And back when we had an interstate maintenance discretionary uh, program, if you uh, transferred any of your interstate money, you couldn't apply for the discretionary grants because the feeling was by Congress, well, if you had enough interstate money to transfer, you didn't need a discretionary grant. So it was just something that uh, apportionments are the key to the states. That's the big money. And of course, you can see here it's only 8% of the funds, and a big portion of that is for federal lands and tribal lands uh, of the amount that's available. Now, I said with the formulas, when we had 13 formulas, they consisted of factors like uh, diesel fuel sold, uh, miles of interstate, and all various uh, types of factors for the different programs, and they were weighted. And the reason they were weighted was because some states, the different characteristics of various states. And so Congress decided, well, we'll go with one formula now. And so what they did, they came up with, instead of saying, uh, well, we're going to, we will apportion X number of dollars for the STP program, X number of dollars for the safety program. They decided that they would authorize a lump sum for a fiscal year, uh, like $37 billion. That's the total amount that has to be divided among the seven apportioned programs. So the, of the 37 billion nationwide, then they had to calculate how much went to each state. So basically, uh, it was based on 2012, how much money Utah received in 2014, how much you received in 2015, was based on fiscal year 2012, the amount in, of, of apportionments you received that year. So once uh, we calculated the lump sum for your state, then we had to calculate what 95% of your state's contributions to the trust fund were. And once we had the 95% rate, then we looked at your lump sum. Well, if you receive, if your lump sum was less, than the 95%, uh, we had to give you more money. And how did we give you more money? Because it was only X number of dollars for lump sum total. Well, we'd take a little bit from everybody else and bring your state up to 95%. So the key to all this is that um, you need to get at least 95%, but you can get a lot more if the numbers work out in your favor. You know, everybody doesn't get 95%. The way it's written is 95% or more. So we calculate that, and then your state ends up with an amount of money. And then you have to divide it up among your apportioned programs. Now, uh, CMAC, which is Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, and Metropolitan Planning 
is determined by a ratio. It's based on the ratio of your fiscal year 2009 CMAC apportionment compared to all your apportionments in 2009. So you get a percent share, you multiply that uh, times your lump sum, and you come out with your uh, CMAC amount. Of that total amount you receive, how much has to go to CMAC? And same way with metropolitan planning. Again, it's a ratio. It's based on your apportionment of metropolitan planning funds in 2009 to the total apportionments in 2009. Again, you get a percent share. You multiply it times your lap sum, or lump sum, excuse me, and you come out with how much goes to the metropolitan planning program. And let's see. Now, the remaining uh, three are by fixed percentages. You subtract the amount that you set aside for metropolitan planning and for CMAC from your total lump sum, and then you take 63.7% of that. That goes to your National Highway Performance Program. 29.3% of the remainder goes to STP, and the safety gets the final 7%. Now, once you have your apportionments, you have to set aside amounts to fund various other things. Now you can see from these programs on the left here are considered to be what they call the core programs. And so from the first four, pro first four core programs, you have to take 2%. That's your statewide planning and research money. Anybody here do statewide planning and research? No planners, all engineers. So that's how that money's funded. Now, this is a minimum. If a state wants to use more than the 2% for planning and research, it's fine. But that's a minimum. Then from the safety program, we take $220 million, and this is from the total that's authorized, okay, from that lump sum. We take $220 million, then we divide it up among the states according to uh, their rail highway crossing, how many you have, how many need fix, all that stuff. And uh, that's how that program's funded. Then from the STP program, you remember this morning I miss, mentioned those off-system bridges, bridges that were on roads where the road was not necessarily eligible, but the bridge is. And what we do there is, since we don't have a standalone bridge program every, anymore, we take 15% of the amount the state received for the highway bridge program in 2009 and we subtract that from the, your STP program and that would be the dollar amount that you have to use on off-system bridges. Here again it's a minimum. Uh, you can use more if you want to. Uh, and again you can have that amount reduced if you can prove that you do not have a lot of off-system bridges that are um, deficient and some states do do that and finally the transportation alternatives program that's a new program with map 21 and what it did it took the place of uh, rec trails and safe routes to school and uh, different programs like that it just kind of made them an elig eligibility and the funding for that program comes from a set aside from each of the core programs. So this TAP set aside, the way it's calculated is we take the total amount that's authorized from the trust fund for a given fiscal year, and of that amount we take 2%. So it's just a number. We aren't taking any money yet. Then we divide this 2% amount 
among all the states in the same proportion that the states received their 2009 transportation enhancement money. That used to be a uh, standalone program transportation enhancements was and it was very controversial program. A lot of people said if you're a highway person you hated it and if you were not a highway person you loved it and some states took uh, put a lot of effort into basically killing the program. So uh, here again, they're basing uh, what you get for the TAP program on the 2009 TE program. So once that amount is settled, your proportionate share of that 2%, uh, then we divide, then you have to take a set aside from each of your core programs to make up that total amount. And of course, if your NHPP program makes up 40% of your program, of your portion programs, then you'll have to take 40% um, for the TAP program from your uh, NHPP funds and on down the list, which probably metropolitan planning for a lot of states is probably their smallest of the proportional shares, so the least would come from it for from that program. Now, uh, this is how TAP is divided up. Every state goes through this. You have that amount you figured out comes from each of your core programs, makes a total lump sum for the TAP program. Then you have an option. You may have a rec trails program or you may opt out of the rec trails program. If you have the rec trails program and every state does except one, uh, you set aside an amount for your rec trails program, whatever's left from this amount, you divide up 50-50. 50% goes to any area of the state and then you divide it, the other 50% by population, areas of greater than 200,000, areas of 5,001 to 200,000, and areas of less than 5,000 population. So uh, this was Utah. Uh, your amount that you took from your five core programs for a TAP, the Transportation Alternatives Program, equaled 4.3 million dollars. You do have a rec trails program. You weren't the state that opted out, so uh, 1.04 million goes to your rec trails program. The remainder is 3.3 million. Half of that, 1.6 million, goes to any area of the state. The remainder is divided up, the remaining 50 percent. Um, 1.2 million goes to your TMAs. 0.25 million to your areas of 5,000 and 1 to 200,000 and 0.17 million goes to your areas of 5,000 or less. So that's the way it's divided up. And this suballocation is not, not anything new. Uh, we do the same thing with STP and this has been STP program uh, somebody asked me about block grants uh, after the f hour this morning and did I think there would be more block grants uh, as the program went on. The STP program was originally set up as a block grant program where you would get a, an amount of money as a state and you could do whatever you wanted to with it um, as long as it was highway related. Well, needless to say, then politics took over and this is what we ended up with. We have your, your state, we take the STP, the apportioned STP amount, and we subtract from that the portion of STP that had to go to the TAP program and the 2% SPR. Then you have your available STP funds. 50% of that goes to your 
areas of population, 50% goes to any area of the state. Now, if a state is penalized, which I don't think all, Utah is, uh, I don't think you have any penalties. Uh, the penalties would have to come out of that 50%. And your set aside, remember that 15% for off system bridges also has to come out of that amount that goes for any area of the state. So for Utah, uh, actually you did have a penalty, but it, you don't take it, which. Oh, have it years past, so no longer. Okay. So what happens, your apportionment, the amount, uh, your 29.3% uh, amount for STP came out to $62.2 million. You subtracted uh, $1.2 million. That was the share of STP that went to TAP. Your 2% was $1.2 million. Your available STP is $59.8 million. Now, 29 or 50% of that, which is $29.9 million, was divided up among your populated areas. And uh, you had a penalty prior to now, so, but you didn't take it from STP. Uh, that's your option when you're penalized. You don't need to take it. It's up to the state what program they want to take it from. So, and your set aside for off system bridges was 1.3 million. So that's how your um, STP funds was divided up. And every state goes through this. Uh, even the District of Columbia goes through this calculation. And of course, these are your TMAs. These are your three areas that are over 200,000 population. And they would be the ones that receive the money in the greater than 200,000 population box. Now, penalties. We talked about the penalty that you used to have. Uh, the first set we look at are reserve uh, type of a penalty. Basically, uh, if your state does not have a repeat offender or an open container law that meets government requirements, uh, an amount of your STP program and uh, NHPP program is withheld in reserve and then it's up to the state what they want to do with it. You can use it for uh, highway safety improvement program funds or you may transfer some of it to section 402 program which is another safety program that uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration runs. Used to be prior to MAP 21 this money automatically went to uh, section 402 and I know somebody in Congress hated that, that uh, NHTSA was getting federal highways money, so they had it changed. Up to, now it's up to the states, whether you want to use it all for the safety program or send some over to 402. And like I live in Virginia, we have an open container law in Virginia, but we still get penalized because the government requirement is that no open containers in the passenger's compartment of a vehicle. And the Virginia law is that everybody can have an open container except the driver. And that doesn't meet their federal requirements. So Virginia gets penalized every year. Uh, when we get into more serious, this is where we withhold the apportionments. And in cases you lose them, Minimum drinking age, if you do not have a minimum drinking age of 21, we withhold 8% of your apportionments and it lapses immediately. It's gone. I mean, whatever your apportionments would have been, they're reduced by 8% in its history. Uh, no state is penalized under this currently. Uh, 
the D Puerto Rico is, uh, and it's just something they've been penalized under this ever since there's been a penalty. Uh, 0.08 blood alcohol content. Again, this is one where if you're not enforcing the law, you can be penalized under it. Um, and again, it's a little different. We withhold a percent of your STP and NHPP program, but you have four years to get it together. If within that four years you start enforcing your current law, uh, we give you your money. But at the end of four years, it lapses. And of course, no one is penalized under this, either of these penalties right now. And of course, the last one basically withholds any project approval. So basically, it shuts down the federal aid program in a portion of a state, or it can be a whole state. Uh, and that's for failure to maintain federal aid projects and uh, not being in compliance with Clean Air, um, the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act's one that we have quite a few areas that are penalized under this. We have no states that are penalized under this, but we have areas of California. Uh, there were areas in Tennessee. Uh, at one time, the Las Vegas region was threatened with this penalty. It was never applied, but they were under threat. And the Atlanta area down in Georgia was also threatened under this. Uh, it gets threatened. This is a big deal uh, if we shut down project approval because so I think we threaten people more than we apply it because that's taking a big step when you shut down a state's program in a region such as Las Vegas. So there, there's a lot more penalties, but uh, a lot of them are not administered by us. So these are the only ones we talk about. Uh, failure to maintain federal aid has only ever been applied one time since it's been a penalty. And uh, so it's tough to get that one out. Now, we distribute the funds to you on October 1st. You have four years to use those funds. You have the current fiscal year plus the three upcoming fiscal years. And we use the first in, first out method of accounting. We always assume that you are spending, as a state, you are spending your oldest money first. So to give you an example, in 2012, if you received as a state... Um, $30 million for your STP program. And when it comes down to 2015, that would be the four years, if you have obligated $30 million in that program, we assume it's the fiscal year 2012 apportionment. So you don't lapse any funds. You don't need to say when you're obligating funds on a program, you're, whoever does the obligation for you with the division office, I guess the financial people, of course. Uh, you don't need to say we are obligating uh, this much from 2011 or 2013, this much from 2014. You just say we're obligating STP funds. And that's the way it goes. That's a little been a little tricky here with having a two-year bill, uh, you get new codes and you still have money left over from the prior years. So um, it makes it trickier, but a lot of the federal government has to say whenever they obligate monies, it's from each year. You tell them, you know, this number is coming from this year and this one from another year. And, of course, when 2015 gets here, an example that I just gave you, they don't wait till September and say, oh, by the way, state, 
um, you're getting ready, you're going to lapse um, $5 million at midnight tonight. Printouts come all along and you can tell what's going to lapse perhaps and uh, from what program and everything. So, um, but that's the way we do the first in, first out method of accounting. Well, you can transfer your funds to where you need them. This has been liberalized tremendously from previous legislation. Now, uh, since MAP 21 was enacted, you can transfer 50% of any of your apportion programs to any other apportion programs. Uh, it's that simple. It's uh, not like it used to be where it's all kinds of hoops you had to jump through for some programs and other programs you could just transfer. And I don't remember when I was here, but do you transfer much here? Okay. So, and it, what it is, it's a flexibility that's built in. Uh, Congress put it in because you only have four years to use your funds, so you get them where you need them for whatever projects you're doing. And, of course, you can't transfer rail highway crossing uh, funds. This is kind of a program the states love to skip. And uh, so Congress has moved this thing all around trying to get the states to spend the money uh, for this program. So now you can't transfer them. Uh, metro planning funds, you can't transfer. And, of course, you're sub-allocated by population STP and TAP funds cannot be transferred. So some of this is new, some of it is uh, carried over. Now, obligations. Up until this point, you've had this line of credit, but you can't use it because you need to have the ability to obligate it. You just have a number on paper. Now obligations is state requested and federal approval. Um, when they get Utah, UDOT gets ready to obligate, you'll get a hold of um, Trevor over here and tell him, you know, we want to um, obligate X number of dollars from this program on this project and it's a project authorization form is filled out and it tells how many dollars you are obligating from what program and do you do it all electronically now? So it's not like it used to be where you had to carry papers uh, back and forth and once that form is signed um, that's committed that amount of your line of credit to that project and the other thing it does is commits the federal government to a reimburse the state for every eligible expense on that project or, or activity at a later date it doesn't say within two years or whatever uh, the federal government will reimburse you it's the federal government will pay the federal share at some time down the road when that project's completed or a phase of it's completed. Uh, usually the amount obligated is based on estimates because project amounts can change. One thing it does do, it protects funds from lapsing. Okay, that four-year clock stops the minute you obligate those funds. This doesn't mean you can obligate funds just to stop the clock, uh, but it, for those funds, the clock stops. And of course, with our program, since we are not subject to appropriation, uh, it's the only way Congress can control how much money we sp can spend. Uh, years ago, the states could just spend every bit they received, you know, as fast as they could, but uh, that's changed. Also, 
uh, with projects, once you've committed funds to a project, obligated those funds, if the project is finished and you as a state have obligated too much, those remaining funds, you may de-obligate them on that project and re-obligate on another project as long as you do it in the same fiscal year. If you go past the end of the fiscal year, they're gone. You have to do it within that fiscal year. And again, we're different from everybody else in that aspect because most uh, of the other federal government programs, if you need to de-obligate, they're gone that quick. Federal share, I told you this morning, federal share is generally 80% federal, 20% um, state. And it's been that way. Uh, when the program was created back in 1916, Congress felt that it shouldn't be a total federal operation, that the state should have a monetary interest in it. So they came up with these federal shares. Uh, some programs, of course, federal lands, the tribal programs, and so forth, uh, and the territorial programs are 100% federal share. Emergency relief, uh, it's 100% federal for any repairs made to the facility within 180 days. So if you have a bridge that uh, collapses for whatever reason, uh, it, any repairs you would make within 180 days are 100% federal. After that time, you would have to use other funds. And it's to get the facility up and working again. That's what emergency relief is all about. Now we have all kinds of uh, special rates of federal shares. Sliding scale, that's if your state has a certain percentage of federally owned land in the state, uh, you can have a higher federal share rate. You can go up to 95 percent rather than uh, 80 percent. Do you use it? You do, don't you? How much is it? Oh, 93 percent. See, that's pretty good. You're one of the higher ones. Uh, Nevada is the highest, 95 percent across the board. Uh, Arizona is 94 point something. So you're right there in the top of the heap because it's because you cannot get taxes from those lands that are owned, owned by the federal government so they allow you to do that and of course if you do some sorts of uh, safety projects you can get a hundred percent innovative delivery methods workforce development again you can get 100% federal share. Now you can't use, like you can't do designated safety projects with your total highway safety improvement program, but uh, you can use a percentage of it. And these are something Congress has added. Now, payments to the state. So you've obligated money, okay, your funds. You our phase of the project is finished and of course you want to be reimbursed for all your eligible expenses or paid for all your eligible expenses so your contractors done the work the contractor sends a bill to the state then the state submits this voucher to federal highways and says we would like to be paid for all these expenses so federal highways uh, reviews the voucher and we send it over to the Treasury. We tell the Treasury basically liquidate the bonds that make up the Highway Trust Fund and pay Utah these eligible expenses. So the Treasury sends an electronic uh, funds transfer to the state. That's how the, the, or the bills are paid. So any questions on the bills? How much time do we have left? 
five minutes. Now, when we ob... Oh, 10, okay. <laughs> That's okay. Oh. When uh, funds are obligated, what this little graph here shows is, is once funds ha are obligated, how quick do they become an outlay to the trust fund? And this is something that was developed by the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, Federal Highways didn't do it, but it's pretty accurate. And what it means, basically, if you look at it, is like of all the funds that are obligated in fiscal year 2016, this year, 27% of them will become due this year in the current fiscal year, 41% the next year, 16 the third year, and on out through nine years. Now this covers everything that's taken out of the trust fund. It's pro highway projects, it's wages, uh, building rent, anything that federal highways uses federal do dollars out of the trust fund for. That's what, the, and this is called the payout curve. Okay. Any questions? The penalty that you used to have, the 164. Those to the open container and repeat offender, they're the most applied. There's probably over half the states have either one of those or both of them. And sometimes it's, it's cultural, more or less. You know, some states just don't see an issue with drinking beer while you're driving. And... Thus, they don't have an open container law. Uh, I know I told the people that were here in May, Louisiana has drive-in daiquiri windows. I mean, it's like going through McDonald's. And as long as you don't put a straw in the cup, it's not considered an open container in Louisiana. And they think that's just the most normal thing to do. But, of course, they get penalized every single year a portion of their highway funds has to go to safety projects. So, that was a, any other questions? Okay, uh, you want to do your drawing? Check, hello, check, check. Okay. Tracy. Tracy won't come up because she thinks she's going to win. 
Yeah, just put yours over there. You can pull it out. If you win, they'll know, though. Okay. Let's just go down the row. Um, we'll do the first one. Everyone gave us a ticket, right, though? Everyone good? Okay. Your first number is um, 279-0509. Sydney. See, we have to entice you to come back because we have more drawings, more prizes. <laughs> okay, the next one is, I guess they're all 279. The last digits are 517. Yes. All right. Is it coming up? Sorry about the noise, too. I think the next class has, not, has been moved, so it shouldn't be so noisy. Okay, this next one is uh, 506. All right. And I, I really want this, so if you guys don't want it, who wins? <laughs> I had to um, beg for this, these bags. So, oh dear, this one's like ripped. <laughs> Is it? Let's verify this. Is it? I think it says 513. No way. Oh, we got to draw another one then if Kelly won. Is it really? I, I'd like to verify that. All right. Good job. All right. Should we just go for the break then and come back? Okay. All right. We'll do the break and then meet back here for the third and final.